Hello, welcome back to my haunted library. It's Regina. Hope you're all having a wonderful winter. Uh, this is always a tough time of year for me. I don't know if it's sunlight deprivation or I just have the blahs, but one thing that has been helping me cope is reading this entire <laughs> V.C. Andrews series of the, the Dollinganger Flowers in the Attic series. So let's talk about this. I just finished last week with the fifth book. There are five in all. So in 1979, I remember reading this. I was still a wee child, but I remember sneaking this uh, book into the attic to read it in my attic playroom. And that is the first one in the series, Flowers in the Attic. So Cleo Virginia Andrews was born in 1923 in Virginia. She was a Southern lady and her, a lot of her stories take place in, in the South or, and in Virginia, which uh, Flowers in the Attic does for a, a lot of it. And uh, she died at age 63 of breast cancer. So Andrew Niederman, who is an author in his own right, took over as her ghostwriter, actually at the end of this series, and I'll talk about that when I get to it. But there are many, many, many V.C. Andrews books, like The Brand, that she didn't write because she died very young. And um, Andrew Niederman either wrote them or other people wrote them. I'm not sure about the other series. Now, V.C. Andrews uh, pretty much lived a quiet life. She uh, had an accident when she was young where she fell down a flight of stairs and ended up having to be in a wheelchair. So she developed her artistic talents first in sketching and painting and then into novel writing. And when she submitted uh, Flowers in the Attic, her first novel to the publisher, she was given the instruction to make it racier which is probably where that whole incest thing came in. I'm not sure if that's the truth, but that's my guess. And that became the you know, cornerstone of this entire series, for better or for worse. And it is, it is pretty weird concept that this very successful commercial fiction series that was uh, very popular and a Lifetime movie series, which I watched every one, uh, and that wasn't, those were not produced that long ago. And it deals with this very open, uh, incestuous relationship between brother and sister. It, it, it's, it's kind of bizarre. Now, now, that doesn't mean that this hasn't been a theme in Gothic literature from the beginning. I mean, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking uh, The Monk, which one of the early Gothic books uh, dealt with, was like more like Gothic horror. Uh, a priest raping his sister in the catacombs. So, you know, it's, it has its roots in Gothic fiction and, uh, and even like a, a book like Wuthering Heights, which I would also consider Gothic romance. One of the first, um, Heathcliff and Kathy, they're not brother and sister. They're not blood relations, but they were brought up as brother and sister and they're lovers. So, you know, this goes back a, a long way and I guess it's just the taboo aspect of it. I mean, you know, <laughs> it certainly is popular in uh, uh, romance, though. You know, you've got very popular books on um, Amazon that are like, you know, hooking up with my stepbrother. But, but they use the stepbrother as kind of a workaround for that whole thing. Actually, what this book reminds me more of from any of those categories is Peyton Place. It's more like a family drama with a you know, nice dose of sleaze thrown in there. And in Peyton Place, the first book anyway, oh, and the second book too, you have the incest theme. You have um, Selena, I believe her name, the, the poor girl who lives on the other side of the tracks. Her brutish father rapes her and then she kills him and buries him in the backyard. And there's this whole trial. And then in like Return to Peyton Place, I think is what it's called, is the mother, there's this Oedipal complex between the mother and son where she's obsessed with her son so much that she's like listening in on him having sex with his wife and like, getting all flushed, you know. Anyway, this is kind of like in that category. It's, it's campy, which I love. I love camp. I mean, camp can save your life. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you're in the winter blahs like I've been in and you're feeling a little down or just, bleh, you know, this will cure you of your depression. It really will because it, you read people whose lives are so messed up that yours is going to just feel so much healthier in comparison. So that's just my little advice. Anyway, let's talk about Flowers in the Attic. So at the start of Flowers in the Attic, we have this family, you know, this perfect 
family called the Dollingangers. That word, that, that name drives me crazy because I, I can never pronounce it right, I don't think, but it's just such a weird name. So in the Dollinganger family, there's a beautiful husband and wife. Corinne is the name of the wife and everything's perfect. They're living in Pennsylvania. Everything's wonderful until the father dies in a tragic car accident. Corinne, the mother, is uh, suddenly finds herself completely impoverished and, and unable to take care of her family. So Corinne goes back home with the kids to Foxworth Hall, which is this incredible mansion in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia in a very rural area. So again, we get in the Gothic tradition the big house. Every Gothic story has to have the big house. So they go to Foxworth Hall and Corinne's mother, Olivia, is this cold old battle axe and she's evil and she puts the kids up in the attic. Well, these, this room off into like a, an a old wing of the house where they can't be heard. And, and she's like, Corinne, you just got to keep those kids quiet because we can't let your father know that um, they're here because he disowned you. So Kathy and Christopher become surrogate parents to the little ones in the attic. And Christopher is really smart and he wants to be a doctor. And uh, Kathy practices ballet up in the attic. And little Corey has a pet rat he calls Mickey. And they try to have a normal life. They put paper flowers around the attic to make it look like a garden, a playroom for the kids. And they develop, the, the older ones develop a physical attraction for each other. Uh, Olivia, the mother, uh, catches them kind of in the act, or they, they both have their clothes off. I don't remember exactly, but um, she punishes them by c putting tar in Kathy's beautiful blonde hair, and Kathy cuts it all off, and she has this really ugly haircut. Corinne runs off with a guy named Bartholomew, and they take off. They go to Europe, and she's living a lavish lifestyle, forgetting about the kids. She, he doesn't know about the kids. She they've become such an inconvenience to her. She starts uh, poisoning them with arsenic laced powdered donuts and the little boy dies. Kathy and Christopher do have sex and he, he does kind of force himself on her. So I guess, you know, that is, that is something that is a little hard to get past in this book. It's not like it was acceptable in 1979, but you saw more of this type of forceful sexual situations in trashy books from that era, if it makes sense. I mean, something like this would not be published today, I don't believe. Even going back to like Luke and Laura on General Hospital, and I don't know if anyone's old enough to remember this, but that was a really big story. Uh, Luke rapes Laura, and they end up falling in love and, and getting married and, and being like the family on, on the show of General Hospital. Later, they do confront that storyline because I think enough people complained like, that's messed up. But back in the 70s, we all thought it was like, oh, it's so romantic. I mean, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it kind of was the way it was. But uh, so this happens in this story. So Kathy does say, well, I, you know, I did want it too. So that kind of starts this relationship between Kathy and Christopher, which does get very annoying as, as the story progresses, I have to say. But this is where it all begins where uh, Christopher especially just falls in love with Kathy. He can't imagine, like she's the perfect woman. He can't imagine being with anyone else but her. And uh, she's kind of stuck with this relationship with her brother that she doesn't really want. She's very uh, kind of ambivalent about it as, as one would be. So by the end of the story, the kids, uh, Corey dies and Kathy and Christopher uh, decide the only way they're gonna survive is to run away. And that's what they do. So I found some information about B.C. Andrews on the shelves of my own library. In this book, Faces of Fear by Douglas E. Winter. This is really good. It has different, it profiles different uh, horror writers, like uh, I think Clyde Barker's in here. I've read through most of this. This came out in 1985. And yeah, this has all kinds of writers, including Stephen King, Peter Straub, Clive Barker, Whitley Stryber. So I just wanted to read a quote from her, which kind of highlights her philosophy on writing. I write mainly to entertain. I don't think people want moral lessons. In fact, they come up to me and say, you never make a moral judgment. 
That is one of my assets. Readers like the fact that I don't say whether I am for it or against it. But if you read between the lines, you can tell. My books offer more of an honest viewpoint about families and the conflicts within them. I think families can be about the most destructive element in your life. Well, that is the truth. And I think that is what her books are about. It's like the family drama of a very destructive kind. Uh, Southern families are more tightly knit and not always for the better because people are inclined to keep themselves away from having lots of friends because they've got family. I know my mother feels like that. She needs family, but she doesn't really need other people. I feel I do. Families sometimes are so close to you, they are opinionated. When you break the pattern, they're fixed in their mind as to what you are. They are disbelieving. But you don't have to face that with other friends and outsiders and people that you meet. And then this is interesting, considering the themes of her book, especially of this series about revenge of the mother and these uh, horrible mothers. Uh, she's asked, what does her mother think about her writing? And she replies, she doesn't read it. She tells me she hears so much about it that she doesn't need to. That sounds, it sounds like there are a lot of personal issues in her life that she was working out in her fiction. And especially throughout this series, and I know in, in other series as well, like, I, well, I read My Sweet Audrina, and I've read a couple other ones, and I recall many times characters being in wheelchairs. In this, even Kathy is in a wheelchair in one of the books. So she's dealing with a lot of her own issues in her fiction. So I'm going to stop it here because I'm going to review each one of these books. So this will be the start of a playlist maybe. So Flowers in the Attic by V.C. Andrews. I really love this whole series, but I also personally love really campy, trashy books. So I wouldn't recommend it for everyone, especially horror fans, because it's really not horror. I keep saying that, but nothing is really scarier than your family. So maybe it is horror. Uh, and on that note, uh, I'm going to leave it there. So thanks for stopping by my haunted library. I'll see you soon. Bye.